All right. Um, this is uh, this is basically a brief history of of Wendover Field. Wendover, uh, I'm sure most of you know where Wendover is, but Wendover is uh, Wendover Air Base is on the very western edge of Tooele County. Uh, there are a couple of gals there that were that were there at the airfield in 1942. Wendover started out as a railroad town in 1907. The cars were going from, or the rail, rail was going from Salt Lake to California and of course from California back. And the steam locomotives needed a place to stop for water and, and coal. So they built a 35 mile pipeline from Pilot Peak all the way down to Wendover, had a big water tank and that's where the, that's where the, the uh, engines could water up. So prior to World War II, Wendover was a very small town, primarily railroad people, a few that were uh, ranchers. Uh, the official population was listed at about 103. And by, during its peak in the war, there were 17,000 military, 2,500 civilians on the base. Well, in 1939, the United States really had an attitude of isolationist, and they didn't want to they didn't want to uh, get into another war after World War I. But of course, President Roosevelt and Congress and those in the know really knew that it was inevitable. And at the time, our Air Force was simply miserable. We had, we had very few planes, very little capability. Japan and Germany were way ahead of, uh, of the United States. So Congress ex uh, approved the expansion of a number of Air Force bases and Wendover was one of them. Uh, there's a picture of Wendover in 1940. This little building right down here was the old original uh, Civil Aeronautics Administration. And they were there uh, prior to that time. They're actually, the mail planes used to navigate with big concrete arrows that were on the ground. And there was a concrete arrow in Wendover that, that uh, Pointed, pointed the navigation way. So that's what Wendover looked like in 1940. It was originally uh, under the direction of Fort Douglas in Salt Lake City. And uh, a small crew came out in 1940. They started to build some gravel runways, uh, just a few buildings. And that was, the, that was that early detachment. So there's the first PX building. If you can, if you could see that little sign, it would say PX, but there's there's nobody there to buy anything. Here are a couple of the first uh, two-story buildings, two are, are, are the barracks, two of those, those uh, barracks still remain on the base. Here's a picture in May of 1941 of the base. Down at the bottom, you can see just the, there are those four two-story barracks. There were just a few buildings. The runway is, is way off here up in the far, right hand corner, just the tip of it. And there are a few planes scattered around there. Now looking north from the, uh, now you can see that, that piece of runway. And up in the area up here is where a gunnery range was, uh, was constructed in 1943. Well, of course, after December 7th, uh, the attitude of the United States changed greatly and we weren't so isolationist anymore. So following that attack, the real building blitz in, in Wendover started. And uh, to go the whole picture from, from no buildings, the beginning of 1940, by the end of, of 1945, there were 668 buildings on the base. Uh, most of them built by civilian contractors, a few of them built by the military, military personnel. As you look at this, this is the original operations building and it's still here today. That's the building we use for the fixed base operator. But most of these buildings were just built for, with an expectation of a 10 year life. So they were all temporary construction. And you can see what they've done here is they've just put uh, tar paper on the face of the building with some lath strips and they moved on to the next building. Now, later on they put horizontal white 
lap joint siding on that, but this is how most of the buildings uh, started out. Of course, this control tower is still, that's still functional on the base. They never could keep up with the number of people coming in to train. This is up in the northwest corner of the base, but you can see all these little trailers that they've brought in for the, uh, uh, the for the essentially the officers. The enlisted men stayed in the barracks or in tents, but the officers were able to use these little trailers. The Utah Nevada line is that that dotted black line uh, that you see there. You can see these few little buildings over to the side. Uh, during the war, reportedly, there were some ladies that you could rent those buildings by the hour. So that was uh, <laughs> uh, that's a little questionable, but that apparently went on. There was a 300-bed hospital at Wendover, and you can all these white buildings that you see were the hospital buildings. You might wonder why in the world do we need a hospital that big? But if you consider uh, 20,000 people on the base, there are uh, a lot of impacted wisdom teeth that need to come out. There's surgery, there's broken arms. Uh, a number of the officers' wives had babies. So it was, it was quite, a, quite a large complex. And as you see, all these buildings are all separate. So there would be a ward here and another ward there, and the surgery was up here. Uh, back in 1940, that was their attempt at social distancing because they realized that uh, some, if they had infected people in one ward, they didn't want them close to another and they didn't have good ventilation systems. So the buildings really were built in an isolated fashion. And as you can see, there's a, there's a walkway right there, a walkway right there, right here. So you could walk between any of these buildings and still stay inside. And that was the, that was the hospital complex. Well, the question is, what was Wendover's role uh, during the war? And Wendover was uh, what they called the phase two bomber training. Uh, it was for B-17 and B-24 bombers. When, uh, when people started out in the Army Air Force or the Army Air Corps, pilots were trained perhaps in Coffeyville, Kansas. Navigators were trained in uh, Hondo, Texas, bombardiers and Angelo Field. Anyway, they were all uh, trained separately. Wendover's where they came together and formed up uh, the bomb groups, four squadrons to a bomb group. And so this is where I found out that uh, who my pilot was and who my navigator was, who were the gunners. And from Wendover, after they were trained, then they went, uh, went to the field. In 1942, there were four bomb groups that trained. The first bomb group that came, the 306, was a B-17 bomb group. That actually was the first bomb group to fly into the heartland of Germany and, and bomb Germany. Uh, when they came, the facilities were really quite primitive. They set their typewriters on, on cardboard boxes and orange crates and because uh, the building was still, still continuing. The 451st bomb group, there was a reunion in Salt Lake. We met with these guys and they, they were very disappointed with uh, with Wendover because there was no room. They ended up staying in these tents. So they're, uh, and, the, and again, the building just continued right up until the end of the war. Yeah, kind of in the north part of the field, and these are no longer here. These are, uh, there's a soccer field for Wendover High School. Unfortunately, it took these over and we weren't able to, to uh, save any of them, but there were four apartments. Uh, that per, per block building there. Not very large apartments, but if you were an officer and your wife or your family came, then you were able to stay in one of those, one of those block apartments. Just to give you a couple of uh, pictures of historic pictures, of course, a lot of the civilians took care of the, of the necessary jobs. Here's a lady at the, at the telephone PX. Uh, this is a this is a picture in the control tower. Now these are military; these aren't uh, civilians. 
Here's a picture of some guys working on an engine, a uh, B24 engine. One of the things that went over, uh, most of the new aircraft ended up going overseas so that they could be used, used for, the, for the guys doing the bombing. And so a lot of the training planes that went over were kind of war-weary B-17s and B-24s, but they, uh, and they needed a lot of, lot of maintenance. There is a picture in December of 1943 in the Airmen's Dining Hall. And as you can see, they've got a, they've got a Christmas, Christmas dinner all set up there for the people that are gonna come in. Lucille Anderson was able to uh, give us her, her photo album when she was there. She was one of the telephone operators. And there she is sitting on the, the deck of the girls' dormitory. There were a number of USO shows that came to Wendover, including uh, Bob Hope. Uh, and this is a photo of the, one of the USO groups having, having a meal in, the, in the, the dining hall. This is a picture of the chapel. Uh, all the denominations used, used the chapel. And unfortunately today that's been turned into, into apartments in Wendover, so it's, it's uh, no longer available to view, but it was, it was quite a beautiful building. And actually, there's a, these buildings were all the same. The, the chapel up at Hill Air Force Base at the museum at Hill is exactly the same uh, design as what was at Wendover. And in fact, uh, Hill Air Force Base came and got Wendover's church sign. And the sign that sits outside up there actually came from Wendover. And I threw that in. I just like that picture of that guy kind of nonchalantly leaning on the no parking sign. Uh, physical training was an important part of Wendover, so that, that went on as well. And in the barracks, uh, you can't really see it, but there's no insulation in any of these barrack walls. They, uh, they put a piece of Celotex sheathing up and then the siding on the outside. So in the summertime, they were hot. In the wintertime, they were cold. And you could tell who had the seniority because they, in the winter, they were the ones with the bunks next to the stoves. There's a picture of the service club. Uh, this is in May of 44. So some kind of a May Day celebration or maybe a wedding. Uh, but in any event, there were two of these buildings on the base. They were exactly the, built the same. One was the enlisted club and one was the officer's club. The officer's club is the one that we've restored at Wendover. The service, service club or the enlisted one is, is gone. So, but that's, uh, that's how the inside of those look. They had, of course, a number of uh, entertainers and uh, USO folks that came. And there they are in the, in the service club. Well, moving on, there were uh, all of these bomb groups that were trained in, in 1943. Uh, 13 B-24 groups, seven B-17 groups, and of course then the 509th composite group. So they were trained in 43. Uh, these last three began in the end of 43, but at that point in time, we had a pretty good handle on the air war in Europe. And uh, we really did not need to train bomber crews at the same rate that we had before. So when the, four, the 494th group ended up flying into the Pacific, and after they left, the 72nd Fighter Wing came in to Wendover to train. Now they were there uh, really just a very short time from, from spring for a few months. And then the Army Air Force, uh, decided that Wendover which should be the site for the Manhattan Project and for the 509th Composite Group and the 216th Base Unit. So there's a, there's a, crew, of, uh, a crew of four heading off to their plane. Just to give you an idea here, assuming that video will play, That video doesn't seem to, there we go. So this is, uh, 
this is a whole lineup of B-17s. All of these crews were getting, uh, were getting promoted. So they're all lined up on the field there. We're flying, uh, we're flying to the east here. And interestingly, there's a B-24 with its engines rolling at the end of the line. Now we're gonna turn back around and now we're, now we're flying back the other way. It's interesting the way they built the concrete. You can see the concrete is, uh, has various colors. We think that they probably did that so the planes would find an easy way to line up on the, on the concrete ramp. The pilots that came to Wendover and the crews that came to Wendover had, uh, might have around 100 hours of flying time, maybe a little bit less. When you think about putting a pilot in a four engine heavy bomber with only those few hours, they, they would never do that today. And so there were a number of crashes at Wendover, uh, some due to mechanical error or fault and some, uh, some actually some airborne collisions, some bad landings, but there were a number of people that uh, that lost their life at Wendover. So the training, the training was not a was not a slam dunk. There's a picture of a B-24 that came down and he's lost two of his propellers. And there's a there's a picture of this is the 457th bomb group flying over Wendover. You can see the configuration of the runways, which is very typical for the time. They had three runways in all directions so that no matter what the wind was doing, the planes could uh, try to land uh, into the wind. Here's that bombing range that was, or that gunnery range that was up in the, up in the northeast part of the field. You can see these tracks going around. Here's a, right there is a, a machine gun emplacement. And these Jeeps would drive around on the tracks uh, with this little Rube Goldberg mechanism to steer them. Uh, I didn't put the picture in here, but on top of these poles is a silhouette of an aircraft. The gunners would dip their, their bullets in different colored paint so that as they fired at the target, it would leave a uh, little bit of the paint. And when they brought the target down, then they could score the, score the gunners and tell who was, who was hitting and who wasn't. The other real innovation that went over was something called the Tokyo Trolley. They took an old railroad maintenance car. They've got some uh, 30 caliber guns on, machine guns on there. And this guy's driving along so that what, what these gunners can do is fire from a moving platform at a moving target and give them a little better feel for what it would be like to fire from, a, uh, from the plane. And the innovation, I love the innovation. This was all put to, together with scrap and gathered up materials, but look at his seat right here. It says Pepsi-Cola. So it's, it's a five gallon Pepsi-Cola can that, uh, that they opened up and that's what, he's, that's what he's sitting on. So it was just one of those times you just made do with whatever you could. They also had top turret and bottom turret gunners. And here, here's a, a gentleman training in the top turret. Well, again, here's the P-47 group. And when they, uh, when they finished up, the 509th project arrived. Uh, building 211 was their headquarters. That building is still there on 2nd Street, which you come down here. That's the street that you come to Wendover right now. You come on that street. Well, I'm not sure why my, there we go.
Uh, hey, Cindy, did, did you hear the sound on that? You, you didn't hear the sound on that video clip? Oh, well, I don't know what I didn't click properly. Anyway, the, uh, so the Manhattan Project came to Wendover. Wendover was listed as Site K. It was also known as Kingman. The engineering took place in Los Alamos. That was Site A. There were really three projects. The Alberta Project was a project to take the engineering design of the atomic weapons and turn it into a deliverable weapon. The 509th did their uh, flying training at Wendover, and Project W47 was a, a project to assemble and construct a number of, of prototype atomic weapons, none of them with uh, nuclear material. And the 216th base unit was the was the unit that did all that all that assembly. Well, they didn't have a hangar big enough in Wendover for B-29s. Uh, this, this is a photo from 1943, and the arrow shows where the B-29 hangar was constructed. Paul Tibbetts borrowed this saying from uh, aircraft factories uh, because it was so secret. What you hear here, what you see here, when you leave here, let it stay here. When the 509th group came to Wendover, uh, there were about 1,700 people in the group, and there were 400 FBI agents assigned to watch over these guys. Uh, they were uh, disguised as uh, machinists, as mechanics, latrine orderlies, uh, cooks, typists, and they were watching and listening to everybody to see that nobody was making a phone call or talking too much. This is a photo of one of, the, one of the prototype bombs. The early bombs were just filled with concrete, painted black and white, and then they photographed them as the bomb fell so that they could tell if they were, uh, if they were falling properly. And it turned out they needed to redesign the tail fins of both of those bombs because they just didn't fall in a, in a smooth, smooth manner. Uh, loading the bombs, there are two of these pits at Wendover, and this you can get an idea now of how they how they loaded it. The bomb was lowered into the pit. There was a hydraulic mechanism in the bottom of the pit. The plane was backed over the pit, and then this bomb was hydraulically lifted up into the bomb bay and latched, and then uh, and then the plane was taken to the ramp and flown on the on the test mission. Um, the 509th Composite Group, they really, they didn't want any outside people uh, knowing what was going on. So, so the reason they called it a Composite Group is that there was the 390th Air Service Group, the, three, uh, the 603rd Engineering Group, the 393rd uh, Group that, that flew the planes. They had their own military police. Uh, and their own uh, troop carriers that that flew these C-54s. So they didn't need to have any outside uh, people come in. So that the uh, they they kept their uh, they kept everything basically compartmentalized and very secret. Uh, this is a picture of Tom Class and one of the one of the 393rd crews. <coughs> out in front of the B-29 hangar there at, at Wendover. And just taking a look at, at, again, at the area, the bomb pits were located where those two are shown. Uh, those, those are still there today. And those, when we go on a tour, we go out to this, this hydraulic, or that bomb pit. The South Base technical area, clear on the south end of the base, is where they build all these prototype atomic weapons. And uh, you had to have essentially a very, very high level of pass to be able to get out into that assembly area. Uh, this is a picture of what's left of the assembly area. That We've got a couple buildings out there. This big concrete block was in the middle of the building uh, and they would set components on that block in order to be able to do assemble them. The, the bombs, remember, the, the little boy bomb was 9,700 pounds. The fat man bomb 
was just over 10,000 pounds. So these five ton bombs were being uh, assembled out in that area. That's one, again, one of the assembly buildings. They also, the Fat Man bomb had 6,000 pounds of high explosive to crush that plutonium core into critical mass. And when they assembled those bombs, they had these two sites that were even further away in the event of some kind of a, some kind of a problem. Uh, during, during the time that this was going on, we were also launching the JB-2 rocket out at this launch site. The JB-2 was our uh, re-engineered version of the German V-1 buzz bomb. And they were interested in that, in that pulse jet engine, so they were, uh, they were uh, testing those. And part of the thought is that uh, this may have been kind of a cover for what was really going on with the, with the atomic bomb work. We'll just, we'll just bypass that. That, that, uh, that video shows one of the early test drops and the bomb just kind of rattles around. It doesn't, doesn't fall smoothly at all. Well, from May through June, the crews uh, got together. They left Wendover. They, some of them flew in C-54s. They flew to Tinian Island in the Marianas, the Northern Marianas, and that's where the, the actual uh, uh, the deliverable bombs were loaded and flown to Japan. Uh, some of the guys went on troop trains to California and then got on troop ships. Uh, again, some of them flew on, uh, on the C-54s and some of them, the crews of course, flew their B-29s over. Well, the testing continued at Wendover and actually the last test was on August 5th, one day before uh, the bomb was dropped on Hiroshima. The August 5th test was a, was a fat man test. They had a lot of difficulty with the radar altimeters in those bombs, and they were continually testing and tweaking and making sure that, that, those, uh, that those would work. Well, as the war ended, uh, Wendover just kind of shut down. Wendover went from 103 people to just over 20,000. And then nobody really lived in Wendover. Everybody was just imported. And Wendover certainly wasn't a practical place to continue for the atomic, the atomic mission project. There was no university, no real base of population. So all of the personnel, the equipment, the components, uh, the tooling, the fixtures, everything was picked up and taken to Kirtland Air Force Base in Albuquerque. Um, after the war, uh, after everybody had gone home, Wendover was used for a while. Uh, there was uh, uh, some smart bomb training. They, they developed some bombs that had uh, cameras in the nose, some bombs that were radio controlled with fins in the back. Uh, those were kind of tested and tried at Wendover. There was an also, also a project called GAPA, Ground to Air Pilotless Aircraft. And that was the first supersonic rocket that the U.S. tested. Uh, the engineering was kind of based in California. The tests were done out at, uh, at Knowles, uh, kind of uh, east of, east of uh, Wendover. Just to give you a quick idea of what we've been able to accomplish at Wendover, uh, I've just got a few photos. This is a squadron building before and after. Here's the hall of that building. This is the briefing room. This is the officer's service club where we now have our museum. When you come out to visit, this is where you'll, this is where you'll come, the before and after. Another squadron building. This is hangar number five, and the current state of hangar five, and actually the National Guard right now is using that as a base of operations for the training of their uh, little shadow reconnaissance drone. 
Here's the inside of the officers club. This is the mess hall in the bar area. And there it is today. This is the back porch. We've restored a building uh, called the Norton Bombsite Storage Vault. The Norton Bombsite was the bomb, a very secret device at the time that allowed us to bomb from high altitudes. So that was, there's the outside of the building. Here's the inside. These are some Boy Scouts working on an Eagle Scout project. And that's how we've finished it up. This building was really questionable. This was the, the uh, Navigational Aids building. And when we put this building back together, we did it with just the tar paper and the lath strips, like some of the early temporary, temporary buildings were, were put together. The inside of the B-29 hangar, the second floor, no, no roof. <coughs> we're still working on this, but this is the hallway. This, the, these offices on the side were literally getting ready to fall away from the hangar. And we were able to stabilize those. So there's the exterior and how it looks today. And we have once again, an overhead shot of, uh, of Wendover Field. Well, we've been able to get some national uh, recognition. We are a Preserve America community. They helped fund the master plan document. The stabilization for uh, the Enola Gay hangar, we received a Save America's Treasure Award, which was uh, uh, given to us by uh, George Bush. And in uh, 2009, we were recognized by the National Trust for Historic Preservation as having one of the most endangered historic buildings. Um, that, that didn't bring us quite as much money as recognition, but I guess recognition's good. Uh, and we'll, we'll, we're going to download this to, uh, to YouTube, so you'll be able to look at it later. We won't spend much time, but you can see kind of the layout of the base. Our objective ultimately is to have about 20 buildings here that uh, when visitors come, they can go to the dining hall, the control tower, uh, they can go to a barracks, they can go to uh, the, the B-29 hangar and just really get a feeling and an understanding of what it was like back in 1940 to be on a, on a historic base. Wendover is the most original remaining Army Air Force base in the country in terms of the, the number of structures and the originality. It was far enough away that, that people just left and they, they didn't do much with it. So that was both a minus and a plus. Projects that we're working on right now, uh, Landon Wilkie, who's our curator, and I are working on the nurses' quarters. We're going to put a display in there. The Airman's Dining Hall, we've got some continuing work there. We are working now on putting the B-29 restrooms uh, back in order so that that can be a little more public friendly. And then we have a new project that you can see that picture. That's the original guard shack. Uh, to the right there, that's a picture of the guard shack back in the day, but it, it still stands in somewhat uh, decrepit condition, but at least we know what it looks like. So that's one of our projects to put that back together. Uh, just to let you know, right at the moment with the, with the virus problem, uh, they have let us open up. We're going to be open Fridays from 11 to 4 and Saturdays from 10 to 5. Uh, we do a one-hour base tour at approximately 1.30. And we don't have an admission, but we have a suggested donation. So, uh, so we are going to be open and people can, uh, people can come out and, and, and visit with us. So that's the, that's the status. Just, just to give you a, uh, there are some contacts if you, if you would like to get a, get a hold of us. Uh, I've just got a little sketch there of what our, what the guard shack is going to look like when we, when we get this project done. We'll have the guard shack, and we'll have some kind of an, an, a gate arm there, and then with the barracks 
uh, the barracks in the background. So that's uh, that's kind of how that'll how that'll look. So um, any any questions or uh, thoughts? <laughs> James, thank you very much. Or Jim, thank you very much. I've, I've been there on the base. I've driven by the B-29 hangar. Very impressive. Um, I really appreciate the, the earlier history. I Frankly, I was unaware of anything that went on there other than the Enola Gay and the, you know, the preparation with the, the atomic bomb efforts. Uh, but um, Maybe you might also want to just talk a little bit about what goes on there now. Uh, it's it's an active airfield. Sure, sure, I can do that. Um, we actually, <clears throat> of the three original runways, uh, one of the original runways was was paved over with uh, uh, with asphalt, so that that remains. There was another runway that was built. Uh, because the, the east-west runway just wasn't in good shape. So they took the concrete from that, made a base, and, and created a new, a new east-west runway. So we have a 10,000-foot runway and an 8,000-foot runway. Prior to uh, the, this virus problem, we had a, a contract with the casinos, and we were flying about 50,000 people a year into Wendover on these gambling uh, charters. They were going to about uh, uh, 70 different cities uh, and they did a marvelous marketing job. And the good thing about that is that a lot of those people would uh, stop down to the museum. The casinos let the shuttles uh, run the people down to the museum for free. So, so we've had, uh, uh, it, it's, it's an aviation or it's a general aviation field. Uh, private jets can come in. Uh, the jets for the uh, casinos, of course, come in. Every now and again, the, the corporate Smith's jet will come in because we have a, a Smith store over in West Wendover. So it's still it's still a working working airfield. Jim, do you want to talk about how it's this kind of back up to hill? I'm sorry. How what? How it's a kind of backup for Hill? Oh yeah, good good point. In fact, that's uh, I appreciate you bringing that up. It's really uh, one of the more important roles that we play. Uh, when I was running the airport here for about uh, 12 years, we probably had uh, 25 F-16s come in on emergency landings. The Utah Test and Training Range, which is the live fire Air Force range, is just south of us. Uh, that took up a lot of the, uh, the original 1.8 million acres that was the bombing and gunnery range. So that's now the Air Force range. So if they have a problem, uh, Wendover is a lot closer than Hale Field and they'll come in. We've also, now that they're flying the F-35s, we've had uh, probably six F-35s come in with various problems uh, and land here, then they send out a maintenance crew and get the, get the plane repaired so that they can take it back to Hill. We also, uh, the National Guard comes out on a yearly basis. Uh, the Marines have been here doing parachute training. Uh, Hill Air Force Base has the, uh, the 729th Air For uh, Aircraft Control Squadron. Uh, they come out for a week or two and do a training session. So we're really uh, we're really supporting Utah in terms of the military uh, as as a, as a training base. So that's uh, that is that is a, a very positive role. And actually, uh, Cindy Kindred and I have been working uh, with our legislators to try to get a little more federal money in here to try to improve some of the. Uh, some of the infrastructure because we're still we're still working on a 70 year old water and sewer system. Some of it's been repaired, but uh, but we'd like to get that up up to uh, to a more modern standard.
Any other any other thoughts or questions? Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in again. I, I assume that that the Wendover base and all the training that went there, as well as the Nola Gay training, was located essentially where it was. One because it's very isolated, but but also same reason that Geneva Steel was developed in Utah County. The same reason Hill Air Force Base is there. Same reason we have the all the big Navy and, and Army storage facilities that are here is that it was far enough inland that the Japanese bombers could not reach it. That that's exactly right. Um, it it uh, <clears throat> part part of it was of course the geography. The the salt flats were so so flat and so large it was easy to build a a uh, the bombing targets out there but but that is one of the things that's mentioned in in uh, some of the original documents that it's far enough inland that uh, that it, it re they really felt like it was in a safe place plus the western pacific railroad went right by there and us 40 went right by so it really it, it was a great great location exactly us 40 was not much of a us 40 at that point <laughs> well, yes, my my dad was a mining engineer and in the 30s drove that road from from Salt Lake to the gold fields in California and he had some real stories to tell about that road. <laughs> well, okay. Thank you. I appreciate all you coming and listening. Thanks uh thanks very much.